My name is Shankar, uh, and I I am uh, manage the powertrain uh, controls team in uh, Southwest Research, and uh, I'm joined here with my colleague uh, Stas Ganko. And uh, this talk for the last probably about uh, 40 minutes, and uh, the 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 question or the focus of the discussion here is how traffic simulation and applications and how they are being relevant to a powertrain engineering perspective. So here's a, a quick outline of the talk today. So I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with Southwest, so we just wanted to quickly introduce who we are, then talk about this concept called connected powertrain that uh, we have been working on for the past three or four years uh, at Southwest, and then we will bring in the role of traffic simulation and what are the objectives, why do we really need a traffic simulator, and then we will talk about specifically on how we are leveraging tools such as PTV Wisdom and how we are building the, the environment for vehicle testing and powertrain application, and then we will talk about some of the efficiency and energy uh, energy perspectives and benefits of the technology that we have been working on. And then we will uh, summarize uh, with some conclusions towards the end. So a very brief introduction to Southwest for people who are not familiar. So we were established in 1947 by uh, Thomas Lick Jr. We are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit corporation. We are, we are headquartered in San Antonio, Texas. So over here is the, uh, the aerial view of the Institute in San Antonio. So we are about a mid-size uh, company, around 2,800 to 3,000 employees, uh, pretty large facility and heavy, heavy capital intensive facilities like about a 1,500 acre facility, 2.3 million square feet of labs. And we are an applied R&D service provider, so 10 technical divisions spanning uh, the technologies all the way from powertrain to uh, space applications, uh, for, for example, the recent uh, Juno mission was, uh, the PI was from Southwest. Then we have a uh, division for uh, automation and connectivity-based uh, vehicles, then mechanical engineering and so on. And very R&D focused, so a lot of uh, patents and uh, trade secrets and uh, IP in general, uh, revenue in 2019 is about uh, $675 million. So that's that's who we are. And uh, where both we and STAS come from, where we are from the powertrain engineering division, uh, we do everything from uh, your lawnmower engine to uh, locomotive and marine engines, uh, a big focus towards electrification uh, in the recent areas, but uh, we, we span around the whole spectrum in terms of powertrain applications after treatment as well as transmission technology. As automotive engineers and powertrain engineers, one of the key things is that we have spent a good amount of the last uh, decades and spent significant amount of resources and dollar essentially on improving fundamentally the machine uh, that transports us from point A to point B, be it people or be it goods. And here is the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, uh, their historical data on how we have fared in the past uh, four or five decades in terms of fuel economy and CO2 emissions. And as you can see around the model year 2018, from a fleet uh, real-world fuel economy standpoint, we are roughly at about 25 uh, miles per gallon for model year 2018, and the CO2 number is at about 353 gram per mile. As the mobility as a service revolution and connected and automated vehicle revolution started uh, happening in the last decade, one of the questions that we wanted to answer is, Yes, in the recent past years, like powertrain or automotive-centric uh, efficiency improvements are pretty much incremental in nature, like 1%, 2%. And what we want to understand or answer the question is, can we leverage data enabled through connectivity and automation and write software on top of it 
to now not go after incremental uh, <clears throat> changes in efficiency, but achieve leapfrog levels of improvement, such as 20%. And can this be achieved via connectivity and automation? So the question is, can connectivity overlaid with simple vehicle automation lead to significant energy efficiency benefits? So the world around us is getting connected in all sorts of ways. And when I, wanted, when I talk about connectivity, I think I wanted to kind of focus a bit on what exactly do we mean by that? And there is one kind of connectivity, which is just the regular 4G LTE systems that you have in your vehicles these days, like it kind of powers the infotainment, uh, you're able to go uh, look at Instagram or put TikTok videos and see things like that. And then there is another breed of connectivity, which is what we are talking about as the short range communication enabled via two technologies that are kind of gaining some problem, uh, kind of being debated in the intelligent systems world, uh, which is dedicated short range communication uh, platform, which is DSRC. And the other one is the cellular V2X or the CV2X umbrella under the 5G spectrum. But broadly, everything classifies under the V2X category. And primarily what we are leveraging for this application at least is V2V, which is vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure uh, applications. So the next question we wanted to answer is, okay, automation, where are we? I mean, pure L4 technology, uh, it's still some, some time out there. And what exists in the world right now where I can just go buy a car is L2, I can buy a level two vehicle that has the regular radar assist cruise control, our standard lane keeping assist and things like that. And the question, what we are trying to see is even simple levels of automation, what kind of impact do they have? And uh, here is a, a simple experiment, but really nice experiment, which was conducted by these universities. And uh, what the goal here is all the drivers form around a big circle and they have to drive at a constant speed. As you can see, the initial uh, run is okay. And what starts to happen around the uh, 80 second mark over here is something we are all very familiar in, the, in, the, in, the, in our traffic, in our day-to-day -day drive every day. And here are some metrics that were tracked. So in throughput, what are the number of braking events, uh, how did we do in fuel consumption? And what is the deviation of speed of vehicles around us? And what happened is at around this mark, this vehicle alone, we engaged something as simple as cruise control, but the researchers engaged something as simple as cruise control. And now let's see what starts to happen. And initially things look starting to get stable. Keep in mind, all the other vehicles are still driven by regular, normal human drivers. And what starts to happen is something very interesting, that this one vehicle, which has technology like cruise control, not only is its speed becoming steady, it is also starting to affect the, the speed and fuel and throughput, the braking events of all vehicles around it. And it, it has this uh, effect of affecting the neighboring traffic uh, around it. And this is something that is a very key takeaway from this, this experiment. So even simple automation, it does not have to have penetration of technology across all the vehicles around it, even a few vehicles in the traffic environment can have a significant effect of uh, improving uh, performance of vehicles around us. So how we define the, the, the umbrella of connected powertrain is here is our intelligent systems uh, world, which works on things like vehicle connectivity, traffic flow modeling. They build the automated vehicles through the perception, localization, also do the cloud computing, big data, but be it a human-driven vehicle or uh, an automated vehicle, effectively it survives in this environment and translates uh, effect basically through choosing a speed or a decision, it translates into a power demand. 
And then the powertrain engineering folks come into action. And what we do is we say, okay, here is what my user wants, and I'm going to actuate uh, the different uh, exercise, the different actuators on my powertrain to deliver the power demand that the user needs. And where connected powertrain comes in is right in the middle. So step one, what we want to do is we want to leverage data and help uh, the user minimize power demand by helping making him help making him or her smarter driving choices. And the second one is we want. Now that we have minimized or optimized this power demand, now we want to go extract it in the most efficient manner from our powertrain. So the one line objective is leverage connected and automated information streams to improve energy efficiency and performance of the powertrain. With that background, so we started a program uh, called Nextcar. Uh, it stands for Next Generation Energy Technologies for Connected and Automated On-Road Vehicles. And it was a three-year program. Uh, it was funded by the Advanced Research Project Agency under the Department of Energy, ending in fall 2020. And uh, our partners on this program were Toyota and uh, University of Michigan. And applying concepts of connected powertrain, we demonstrated uh, uh, energy consumption reduction of 20% over a Toyota Prius Prime. And this is a, a plug-in hybrid. And if the achieving the 20% target was not challenging enough, one of the key requirements for the program was we shall not make any powertrain hardware changes. And also, we cannot affect the emissions, the safety, or the drivability aspect of the vehicle in any fashion. So in short, all the energy consumption benefits need to be obtained in a, purely through software and data. So the, the way the, the, the technology was structured is kind of a two layers. One, we kind of define it as the, the energy layer. So think about the, the macroscopic level of whole route information. So we are leveraging uh, standard connectivity. So we have course information about whole route we are taking into account things like traffic congestion, where, what is my elevation across the route, stop signs, school zones, where are my charging opportunities, et cetera. And effectively, what, the first thing is choosing an energy efficient route that is specific to your powertrain. And we will cover some of the details later, but the idea being that uh, just always take the fastest route is not the best route in terms of energy. And also, you cannot take too much of a penalty in terms of trip time just to make sure that you're saving energy. So there is a, a compromise, and we, we, we kind of address it. And the second one is kind of a more specific to a powertrain itself. In this case, for example, we have our uh, the, the plug-in hybrid, which has a battery pack as well as a, an engine. Now we are able to leverage this information and say, how do you better plan uh, where my engine should engage, where should my battery uh, or electric machines engage, and high-level planning like this. The second layer is kind of uh, more focusing on a mesoscopic scale, so about a 500-meter uh, radius, so think about it as a DSRC radius range, uh, roughly half a kilometer. And what we have here is shorter horizon, but much finer resolution information. And we have, uh, we leverage the onboard uh, sensing information, for example, things like uh, your radar, your camera, all that gets fused into this layer, along with information about V2V and V2I. And what effectively we are doing in this uh, level is understanding what's the best way to drive or help the driver make smarter driving decisions by minimizing unnecessary acceleration, braking, and also key is like, you know, don't affect the traffic significantly around you as well. So just don't drive really slow just to save on energy. So it takes all, all of that into account. And then here is a summary of the, the the benefits on how our stack up towards 20% was. And you talk about eco routing, which is the energy efficient routing, uh, roughly about 3%. Uh, the power split planning was what we mentioned about the, the optimized operation between your engine and electric machines. And the acceleration smoothing and eco a and talked about eco approach and departure towards signalized intersection, 
And acceleration smoothing basically refers to things like uh, knowing the, the vehicle or traffic around you and now optimizing your driving trajectory to uh, save on energy. So what we will focus on this talk really is more about the, the bottom portion of this pie here, which is where the, uh, the traffic simulation and that kind of application uh, is, uh, becomes very relevant. Uh, one of the other things we are doing, uh, and this is a, a follow-on program, is we are currently engaging uh, with the Department of Energy on a program, and he, on, on the side are highlighted some of our partners on understanding the impact of not just one powertrain, right? How does it, how do concepts like these affect uh, different kinds of vehicles with different powertrains, uh, different levels of automation? If you have level zero and going all the way up to level four, as well as understanding the impact of things like intelligent infrastructure, how can we attain system level benefits via uh, technologies like this? And with that, I'm going to let my colleague uh, staff who will now go into details on how exactly are we leveraging uh, traffic simulation and you know, using it for testing the uh, powertrain. Thank you, Shankar. So first I will discuss the objectives of using a traffic simulator. Now, Shankar kind of introduced the overarching theme of us doing lots of different testing and being able to test out various technologies. So before we actually go out into the field, we want to test a lot of these technologies, a lot of our algorithms on inside of a simulation uh, environment. This enables us to both improve our, uh, improve our software and we can also you know, get a sense of what is the potential benefits from a particular technology. So the traffic simulator itself, we need something that is able to produce real world traffic scenarios. We would like to have streets that we can drive on in a simulated environment that we can control uh, to some extent but that also respond in a very realistic fashion because we want to be able to test in, like I said, a very realistic environment. We want to also enable the calibration and testing, uh, you know, in a controlled environment, but but one that we can we can also modify and change to to better suit our needs. This is a summary of the necessary functions of the traffic simulator. First and uh, foremost, we want to be able to control five ego vehicles. So this is an external control, uh, which would allow us to control the vehicles inside of the simulation and enable us to perform the eco driving maneuvers that Shankar has previously discussed. We next also want to inject uh, 50 other vehicles. We're certainly going to be experimenting with a lot more, but we want to have the interactions of our vehicle, our connected vehicles, with other vehicles inside of the simulation. We want those vehicles to dynamically react to our ego vehicles in order to more realistically represent this environment. Next is data logging. We want to be able to log all of the vehicles simultaneously. This will enable us to perform energy calculations offline for all of the vehicles, not just the ego vehicles that we are controlling. Next is simulation stability. The simulation needs to be deterministic. It needs to be real time because our solvers operate in real time. We collect information, we process it, and then we give the output, the command to the vehicle speed. And finally, of course, our V2X capabilities. Uh, so speed, location, and information of other vehicles needs to be communicated to our ego vehicles. We should then be able to use that information and, in turn, better inform our ego vehicle of the, of the upcoming events. And this does include traffic signal phase and timing information as well. Again, it's just more information for us to better, better dictate what our speeds should be. 
So here's an example of what we are really looking for producing in a traffic simulated environment. At the bottom, you will see a screenshot of Google Maps. It is taken from uh, an origin destination. This was an actual route that we have driven, but we have also collected a lot of information about the traffic patterns from state DOTs. And at a high level, you know, we can of course go to Google Maps and plot out the the velocities, the the average speeds of of this route. And as you can see, there are some areas that are experiencing high traffic areas, and so you'll have a smaller overall uh, average speed. And in some areas, you have free flowing free flowing traffic. We want a simulator that can not just replicate realistic traffic, but also realistic environments. That is to say, we want to, if we were to create this environment inside of the simulation, we want it to have some of these characteristics of slower traffic in some areas, some specific areas that are reflective of the real world. So this is where VSIM comes in. We did an evaluation of VSIM and we saw that it offers some flexibility with what we can do. It offers MATLAB and C++ integration. We, of course, have options of interfacing it with it in a manner of other, in, in, a, in other manners as well. We have flexibility in terms of placement and control of vehicles, which allows us to both inject vehicles where we want to. It will allow us to create more realistic traffic flows, traffic counts, and we can also query any environment features, so roads and traffic lights, as well as other, other vehicles as well. And this kind of brings back to the connectivity of things. So we knew that some development effort would be needed to align the tool with our application, specifically things like you know, V2X. We needed to provide a different way of accessing those resources and providing that information to our Eco, solve, eco speed solvers. So with uh, with VSIM, we're allowed to externally control certain certain parameters in some vehicles, which we needed to integrate with our next car speed optimizer. We needed to do this in a real time fashion, and so we use the COM interface with MATLAB. Our next car speed optimizer is currently written in Simulink, and so integrating it into Integrating VSIM with MATLAB allowed us a fairly quick way of getting to this getting to this uh, achievement. So we're able to send Eagle Vehicle information to the Simulink optimizer. The optimizer solves for for the speed, and the speed command is then issued to the Eagle Vehicle or Eagle Vehicles in this inside of VSIM. Next, we'll look at specifically the VSIM control. So if you look at the overall process, what we're what we're doing with the ego vehicles is first we create a new vehicle type and class. Next we create a route between a specified origin destination. And uh, once once that is done, then we add the vehicle to the simulator. The graph on the right shows the process once we have added the vehicle to the sim starting with the V2X information. First, we query all of the information about the environment. We perform lane and link filtering because the V2X information is generally, it is going to be around a radius and we need to specifically filter out all the cars that are traveling on other roadways or are traveling in a different direction. We only really care about the vehicles that are in front of us. Next, we look at the signal heads. We query all of the features on the on our path, and we figure out where are the signals and what are the timing what are the timing information that is associated with those signals. That information is fed into the speed optimizer, which gives us the target velocity that our vehicle should be traveling. We then command that target uh, target speed from our simulator back into VSIM. And the vehicle in this sim will, of course, our ego vehicle in this sim will drive that commanded speed. We log all of this information, and then we go into the next step of the simulation. So we're currently running between 10 and 20 hertz. So this 
the, the size of that step, step will, will vary accordingly. So first, a little bit, maybe in a little bit more detail, we create the ego vehicle. In order to do that, we create a unique vehicle class and uh, type. Then we also add a, a vehicle routing decision, a static, static routing decision. This allows us to control just our vehicle and other vehicles will not follow necessarily our routing decision. We launched the simulation in single step mode. This gives us the ability to query features within the sim between, in between steps. And then we can add the vehicle at the desired position. Next comes the important part of V2X information. We need to request the information from nearby vehicles and uh, as well as from the infrastructure. So we do that by getting attributes by location. If you have an object in VSIM, a vehicle object, you can go in and ask for attributes by location. This gives you the information that you're, the attribute information of, of, uh, of all the present vehicles in a surrounding radius. We then find the route link sequence for our ego vehicle. We see which, what is the route that we are going to follow. And this allows us to filter down the vehicles in this radius to just those that are going to be in our path. Because we know that in the simulated environment, we will have many different links and lanes, and all of these are gonna be, all of these are somehow interconnected, and the route link sequence is something that connects it to us, to our vehicle. Next, we'll look at the upcoming signal heads. We query the features, and this includes a couple of custom attributes that allow us to look at the remaining time in a particular phase. So as the vehicle is approaching that light, we both get the phase as well as the remaining time in that particular phase. And finally, we look at the desired speed decisions. Anytime our vehicle approaches or passes a desired speed decision, we update that accordingly in the solver because it gives us a target speed that the ego vehicle should be traveling. Now at the bottom, you will see a screenshot that shows the type of information that we're looking for. So imagine you are in the ego vehicle and this is what you'll be looking at. So you can see that there are some vehicles. So, the, the, so these, are, these are the vehicles that are present in front of us. You can see that the distance, uh, the distance that, that those vehicles are present uh, and then as well as some other more relevant information such as their speed. We can use the speed, the speed of the vehicles in front of us to more accurately decide which speed we should be traveling. Because if we know that this vehicle is stopped and it's fairly close to us, even though this vehicle is still traveling at some speed, we don't need to also follow, try to follow it. We can begin to slow down knowing that the vehicle ahead is stopped. So then we actually command the ego vehicle speed. Now that we've parsed all the information uh, for each uh, ego vehicle and pass it to the optimizer, we set the vehicle speed from our simulic environment back into VSIM. We save all the vehicle positions as well as some of the attributes to a log file and we advance the simulation step. Now, I will come back to this as well. We are saving the vehicle positions of all vehicles in the simulation. Because coming back to what we're trying to do here, we're trying to see whether our ego vehicles can, one, benefit themselves, but two, how do they affect the environment around them? We care about the throughput of a particular roadway. If our vehicles act in such a way as to slow down other traffic, that is a big negative. But do our vehicles also affect the other vehicles in the simulation in a positive way? Are we actually perhaps providing some of that speed smoothing that you saw in the initial video? This is the control panel that we're using in Simulink. It is fairly basic, but it allows us to add ego vehicles whenever we want to. Between, you'll see at the top here, these are the origin destinations that we can set. Once we add the ego vehicle, we have these control panels that show us in real time what our vehicle is doing. So this is the speed that we're traveling. 
And then this is the information about the lead vehicles in front of us. So we can see that there is a vehicle in front of us at 41 meters. There's another vehicle beyond that at 86 meters. They're both traveling at eight kilometers an hour. Next, we also have information about traffic lights. This includes information about the distance to that traffic light, its state, this is a, an enumeration, and then we also have the time remaining in that particular phase. We can at will start and stop the simulation as well. And of course, the simulation can be run without adding any ego vehicles, in which case traffic will continue to flow as it would by default. In a little bit more detail, this is the eco driving control. And to summarize, we, in a, in a more perhaps simpler fashion, we acquire the V2, V2V and V2I data. The ego vehicles are controlled via an external command, that is to say, our solver. The performance needs to be 10 hertz or better because we are doing this in real time. And we need to have the lane level identification and filtering of vehicles. You will see right here, for example, that we are in this yellow vehicle. As we are approaching this intersection, we on the left, you will see that we see four vehicles in front of us, as well as the traffic light, its distance, its state, and its time remaining. All of this information will feed back into our solver, which allows us to more, uh, to more accurately give a good uh, speed uh, decision. And then we're looking at the, we're going to look at the post-processing framework. So remember, I said that we log not just our vehicles, but all of the vehicles in the simulation. What do we do with that information? On the left, you'll see the traffic simulation software. This is what gets us all of the data about the vehicles in this environment. That information is then fed into a number of scripts. Uh, these include the GT models. Uh, these include Simulink models. And these are models of different vehicle powertrains. This information is then able to be uh, summarized in a, in a visual fashion where we can take any of the vehicles from the simulation, we can assign it a particular powertrain, and then we can determine how much energy was expended by that vehicle. Now, one of the important things to note is the, uh, the powertrain mix of traffic can be tuned in order to understand the energy on energy, the, the impact on energy consumption. Because of course, ICE, internal combustion engines, are going to perform much different than a plug-in hybrid. And we've also seen studies that show that, that predict that up to 35% of uh, vehicles will be hybrid electric or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles in the market. And so how does a different powertrain mix in the future affect the overall energy consumption and how do we, how can we uh, impact that as well? More specifically for our program, this is the simulation corridor that we're looking at. Uh, this is a corridor in Columbus, Ohio. It is 3.7 miles long. It has 27 major signalized intersections. Uh, it starts from the uh, south portion of the central business district and goes up north along this high street, which uh, terminates at approximately the end of the high State campus. The reason we chose this is because one of our partner, partners, Continental, operates a smart intersection stack at this intersection on Goodale Street. What this intersection stack provides us is a vision and radar systems to track other vehicles. Now, in the in the real world, we have very limited information about connected, connected vehicles. Simply, connected vehicles are not as prevalent, uh, are, not, are not as uh, yeah, prevalent in the current market. This smart intersection stack will actually enable us to bring in non-connected players into our environment. Doing the evaluation along this corridor initially, will allow us to test our systems in a simulated environment, and then we can actually bring this, bring our vehicles, bring our systems into this, into this real world and compare how our results uh, match up. Now, if we look at the energy benefits behind eco-driving, 
One of the things that we've done in the past, this was with the NextCar program, is we had a traffic simulator that was integrated directly with a vehicle on a hub dynamometer. As the vehicle is driven in the vehicle, as the vehicle is being driven by a human in on the dyno, that speed is communicated in real time to the traffic simulator. That vehicle, of course, will move in that environment and provide, uh, and its environment, of course, will change in real time. The driver of the vehicle on the dyno can, in turn, see the changes in the in the simulated environment and react accordingly, just as they would driving in a realistic environment as, as well. And this is where VSIM is another tool that can help us greatly because it has some nice 3D capabilities. And some of the images that I've uh, shown in some of the previous slides showcase some of some of that capability, where we can have a driver who sits who's who's sitting with a with a screen inside of a you know the simulated environment responding to responding to the environment in a realistic fashion and we're tracking all that information on a vehicle and hub, dyno, hub dynamometer this gives us the ability of quantifying the any energy benefits of our route and this is a summary of some of the benefits uh, of a vehicle that we've tested on the on the, on a dyno what you're seeing here is a bivariate distribution. The lines in the orange are the probabilities that our so using using a collection of of simulated drives, we're able to plot out the energy consumption as well as the trip time for those particular routes. So this is going to be the orange lines are going to be the uh, so these different data points are going to be our eco driving vehicle, and then the black uh, the black symbols are going to be the routes uh, that were taken by default by the by the default simulated simulated software. So you can see a shift in the mean towards the left, which means that the eco driving vehicles are actually using less energy to traverse the same route, and even a shift in the downwards direction, which is strip time, showing that we have a slight advantage also in the amount of time that it takes for vehicles to tra travel through this corridor. Now, this is very, very positive news for us because it shows that indeed the eco driving software does have some, does have a quite a bit of merit to it because we're seeing a uh, very significant 10% energy improvement for vehicle on dyno just using using this particular speed control and using uh, this particular traffic environment. So in summary, as the connected powertrain, as, as part of the, 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 the purpose of the connected powertrain is, uh, you know, we're evaluating uh, system-wide improvements using things like intelligent infrastructure, we're evaluating diverse powertrains, as well as various automation levels. In order to evaluate this, we are using, we are performing controlled calibration and testing. For that, we're using the connected simula simulated environment in environments like VSIM. We are able to externally control vehicles from these simulated environments. And then we are operating the, our connected automated vehicle dynamometer in order to give us numerical quantity behind the, the numbers that we're seeing in the simulated environment. That is all that we have for the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat window, and uh, we will answer them at closer to the end of the presentation. Uh, this is our contact information. Uh, if, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.